I was born in Haiti, yeah. um, but my family immigrated when I was a kid, baby. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the United States as, an, as a Haitian immigrant. Yeah. Um, but I always had an urge for some reason, God put it there, um, to go back to Haiti. Now it's not the usual trajectory of mm -hmm. immigrants to go back from the country that they left. Yeah. My family left Haiti for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not it's not common to go back, but God put this in my heart to really go back and to help to contribute to the development and transformation mm -hmm. of my country. And so after grad school in 2015, yeah. I went back to Haiti and I did an internship with Tear Fund. Yeah. Um, and I ended up staying. Mm -hmm. And so uh, God really led me, led me back really through the story of Nehemiah. Okay. How Nehemiah went back to his city, Jerusalem, helped rebuild the walls. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. a lot of times in the churches, especially in Haiti and in other developing nations, people see the gospel as good news for um, life after death. Mm -hmm. They don't see it as good news for now. And so Interim Mission, you know, tells us that, hey, it's, the gospel is about proclaiming the good news, but also demonstrating the good news of the kingdom. Um, and in our demonstration, you know, it's about how can we um, manifest God's kingdom as much as we can mm -hmm. now, knowing that it won't be perfect, but how can we work towards that? And our mandate is to respond to the holistic needs of people, um, of, of the community, of creation. And so it is our mandate to respond to the problem of poverty in the world. Um, and in Haiti, the church has been on a journey of growing, developing, of understanding scripture again, of understanding the kingdom again, um, of first of all, you know, be, becoming united um, and reconciling the challenges that were, you know, uh, you know within the church locally in Haiti. Um, the young people um, that we started this initiative with in Haiti um, were able to pilot a green jobs project. Um, and the pilot went so well that the project was funded by the FCD. So now we're in a three year project um, scaling that up. What they are doing is they basically um, created a waste management business. Um, waste management services in that part of the city were non existent. Mm -hmm. And so people would just kind of throw their waste in the river, on the street, they would burn it which we know is not good for health, not good for the environment, um, causes disasters and, you know, with rains, floods. Yeah. And so they've um, provided this service of waste collection, but also trained families on how to manage their waste in the home, mm -hmm. segregate their waste and recycle. And so they collect that waste from the families um, and then they transform the waste. The organic waste gets transformed into compost, the plastic waste gets transformed into paving tiles, and then they are able to then sell these products. So not only does it restore the environment, mm -hmm. does it, only, it also improves health, but most importantly, it creates employment for young people. And creating employment is the most sustainable way of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what this project is, 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 is trying to do, creating a model um, that can be replicated throughout the country where um, we respond to the needs of the environment, health, but also create employment to get people out of poverty. So we're really excited for what's what, what, what that's going to be. And a lot of times Christians were good at talking, but not always good at doing. And so we kind of looked at the basic stories in, in the scripture. Um, a lot of times we spiritualize the stories, but when you take a look at the story of Moses, mm -hmm. it's a story of liberation of people. You know, let my people go, bro. Yeah. You know, like let these people out of slavery. Yeah. Look at the story of Esther. Again, it's a story of justice. She goes to the king and says, hey, if you don't do something, you're going to kill our people. You know, the story of advocacy and standing up. And so when we looked at these stories and we looked at the biblical testimony, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, they realized, hey, you know, there was something that we should be doing mm -hmm. to respond to the injustice, to the, you know, needs that our people have. And so I think it was that kind of reframing of the scripture mm -hmm. um, that really set them on the course of, all right, this is our mandate to do something now. What is it that we can do? It's a tough one because Haiti is in a really vulnerable place right now. Last year, our president was assassinated. Um, and since then, there's been a rise in kidnappings, gang violence, there are gangs who are controlling different parts of the city. Um, and so now the country's kind of in a place where we're looking towards elections, not knowing what it's going to be. 
which is a major challenge, but it also provides a major opportunity mm -hmm. because there is space for influencing, mm -hmm. um, influencing the people who are willing to vote in new elections, but also influencing the new um, regime that's going to come in and lead the country. And so I think the church is positioned well mm -hmm. at this moment uh, to be the light and to influence the next few years and what that will look like um, if we if we stand up and, and do so. So I, I'm, I'm praying that, you know, now, um, you know, the church would begin to get ready and, and get prepared for that time um, where we can influence our people um, and influence the leadership um, for the standards of the kingdom.